What's going on with y'all, man? Let me make sure my volume is straight. Everybody pop on in the room. Are y'all good? What's going on, man? <clears throat> Excuse me. Just waiting on everybody to pop on through. And we can make it happen like we always do on these wonderful nights, man. Glad to have y'all in here, man. Welcome to um, the Tariq Nasheed Twitter space. While we're getting everything started, I would like for everybody to give me a retweet. If y'all can give me a retweet, that would be absolutely phenomenal. Give me a nice, good retweet. Let everybody know that we're live so we can get the room packing. I see a lot of the regulars in here. Say, Brother McCow. I see um, Brother Ra. I see, um, I ain't seen T.S. Giselle in a minute. What's going on, T.S.? Um, let me see. Shout out to everybody tuning in. <clears throat> a lot of stuff we're going to talk about. Um, before I get started, don't forget, man, we have an event coming up at the Hidden History Museum, February 24th. Um, it's going to be popping. You guys can go get your tickets, RSVP, right now at Hidden historymuseum.com. It's the one-year anniversary of the Hidden History Museum. We're going to have a great time, celebrate. we got complimentary food, complimentary drinks. We're going to have comics. It's going to be a great night, and we always have a great time at the Hidden History Museum. So go to hiddenhistorymuseum.com and get your ticket, everybody. What's up, Sister Nikki, the God? Everybody say what's up to Nikki, the God. Shout out to her. Oh, man. Now, listen, listen, today and for the past couple of days, people have been acting butthurt because the Black National Anthem would lift every voice and sing was sung at the Super Bowl. And people are talking about the ratings and, you know, uh, the, the ratings were huge. But the white supremacists just happened to get butthurt over them singing the Black National Anthem first, and a lot of them are just really bent out of shape. Oh, why? why oh, that's so divisive. Oh, God, these Negroes are so divisive. There's only one National Anthem, and that's the Star Spangled Banner. Uh, one of these suspected white supremacists, Jake Shields, he's like an MMA guy. He's some kind of fighter or whatever. He's like, well, do Mexicans and Asians and all these other groups get to sing the national anthem, their national anthem, and well, in fact, they do. Y you know what? Yeah, some of these groups do sing their own national anthem, especially when they're fighting a black fighter. Um, notice when they um have them fights where they're fighting Floyd Mayweather, them boxers, they always get up there and start singing some Mexican national anthem or the Filipino national anthem. They do that all the time at their events. You know? When we show black pride and black dignity, that just ruffles the feathers of the white supremacists. That really ruffles their feathers. Because we have, again, that goes back to the moral compass that we have as foundational black Americans. We have a moral compass that nobody has. We also have a, a spiritual capital that nobody has. See, the Star Spangled Banner, you know, that song, you know, it, it has slave references in one of the um, the verses. It has slave references in it. So, talking about bombs in the air and all of that stuff. So, yeah, that represents somewhat of a degenerate mindset of the white supremacists. <clears throat> That's why, you know, the, the United States adopted that song as the national anthem. They only, had, that song became the national anthem, I'm thinking... In the was it the 1930s? That song became a national anthem in the 1930s, right? Whereas "Lift Every Voice and Sing," that song was, um, even though the the Star Spangled Banner was a song written, I want to say sometime in the 1800s. Turn it down. Turn it down. Turn it down. It was written in the 1800s. Um, "Lift Every Voice and Sing" was written in the early 1900s. So the song has. It's, it's kind of been a thing in, in black society. And it's a song, you know, it's a beautiful song. It's a song um, that has dignity. It's not a, about bombing people. You see, but when we show 
that foundation of Black American dignity and grace and humanity, the people with the demonic disposition, they naturally get bent out of shape with it. When we start talking about going back to football, when our brother Colin Kaepernick said, hey, I'm going to take a knee so we can bring attention to inequality and harming Black people, that's not good. Oh, shut up. We're going to blacklist you from the industry. When you put the demonic mindset people on Front Street, they have hissy fits. They really get bent out of shape because you juxtapose our spiritual capital next to their demonic disposition. They know how they look. You understand? They know how they look. So whenever we show dignity, they, they always get their, their feathers, their feathers are ruffled by that. They always get bent out of shape. And we have to stop being afraid to, to show our dignity. We don't have to be afraid to do that. We don't have to be afraid to say, hey man, this is who we are, man. We are we're loving people, we're an honorable people, we are a distinguished people. This is a song, instead of us talking about bombing people and slavery, lift every voice and sing. We're talking about having dignity and pride. There's nothing wrong with that. And let me tell you something, don't let these people shame us for doing things that are dignified. They got a very bad habit of trying to shame us when we start doing things that has some kind of dignity and decorum about it but yet they love to praise degeneracy when there's something degenerate. Notice they don't really say anything bad about that. They don't have a problem with musty twerkers and the sexy reds and, you know, always bring up sexy red and all the drug addict rappers. And they don't really have a problem with that. They have no problem with that. They love that. But let us sing, lift every voice and sing, Oh, what is this crap? What the hell is this? What's with you Negroes and your damn dignity? Huh? Now, if everybody was out there twerking and acting a damn fool, they would have no problem with that. Not whatsoever. But when we show dignity, boy, they really get bent out of shape. Because, again, we got a moral and spiritual capital that other people don't have. We really got to understand our spiritual essence is foundational Black Americans. It's really deeper than what we imagine. We really have to dive into and explore and examine. And we're going to start doing that more because we have, the, we have a major delineation movement going on. And we have to... There, right now, there's a major pride and movement in, in looking at foundational Black American culture, pointing out what it is and celebrating it. Because for so many years, everything that we've done constructive, we've always had to pawn it off to other people. If we did something constructive, we had to give it up to, well, it was an African tribe a, a thousand years ago that was playing the drums and that eventually became hip hop. That, that goofy nonsense. We've been doing that, pawning off our um, foundational Black American culture and lineage and, and, and heritage to all of these other groups. And no disrespect to them, but we are a very unique group. Um, culturally, we are very unique spiritually. The fact that we've endured things that no other group has done. They try to compare us to other people. We've, no other group has done and endured what we've endured and survived with the level of dignity that we have. And people see that globally. Some try to emulate it, but a lot of them just don't have that spiritual essence that we have. And people are always constantly trying to diminish our foundational spiritual essence by highlighting the low-level denominator within our culture. Every time there's a fight video, they try to, oh God, look at that, that's black culture. No, it's not black culture. That's why degenerate behaviors are regulated to just certain sectors of our society as black people. 
that's not our culture. Because if that's our culture, all of the filth and degeneracy that goes on in the dominant society, that's your culture. Y'all try to lone wolf yourselves. Anytime they do something janky, they try to play the, well, it's a lone wolf. It ain't there many damn lone wolves in the world. If a bunch of lone wolves are doing the same thing, that's not lone wolf. That's a wolf pack. That's that, And that means a culture. That is a culture. So we got to stop letting people try to play that game with us. And speaking of our moral and spiritual essence, somebody um, ran up on Kanye asking him about um, Israel and Palestine. Kanye was at the airport somewhere and they started asking him about, hey, what do you think about all the deaths? And I'm kind of paraphrasing here. What do you think about all the deaths and the killings in Israel and Palestine? And Kanye he was like, hey, man, there's people dying in Chicago. I'm concerned with that. Where, where's the outrage for that? Uh, there's people in, in Chicago suffering right now. You know, that's who I'm looking out for. And shout out to my Chicago family, man. It's out there in Chicago. From what I'm hearing, they're starting to evict people. Some of the black people, I saw a video where black people were getting evicted. I think they gave them like some vouchers to relocate or something so they can move in these damn immigrant groups. Man, where, Chicago, where y'all at, man? Let me talk to my Chicago people. I saw a video. I'm like, what well, is it that heavy? Is it getting that heavy out there? So family... And these Democrats that that we've been super loyal to, man, listen, business is business. Let's, we need to get off this loyalty to people thing, this loyalty to a fault. We only have to be loyal to each other. And even that's to a certain degree. We don't have to be loyal to folks within our society who's off code. Because when people talk all that, we all got to get together and come together. and We ain't got to come together with everybody. Let's be clear. We ain't got to come together with everybody. Now, when, when people are off code, we need to get the hell away from them. Because being together with off code people don't mean nothing. You see? So we got to get the game right out here. I'm going to take some calls in a minute. I know a lot of people are trying to get on right now. We are pretty heavy in here right now. And all the new people who came in, don't forget, man, we um, got an event happening at the Hidden History Museum on uh, February 24th, which is what, next week, on a Saturday, 7 p.m., it's going to be popping, the first year anniversary of the Hidden History Museum, RSVP. Um, get your tickets at hiddenhistorymuseum.com. we got comics. We're going to have complimentary food, um, free drinks. It's going to be real nice, man. We always have very nice, fun, festive events at the museum. It's always on and popping. Um, now, speaking of the Super Bowl, a lot of people are still talking about, hold, hold on one second. Sweet, you got headphones, dear? Yeah, I can still hear that, baby. Yeah, my, my daughter's over here. What are you listening to, sweetie? Okay, all right. My daughter's over here listening to positive affirmations from somebody. <laughs> um, yeah, but speaking of, um, the, the Super Bowl, people are still talking about, Hold on, what's my son is up? What you doing up, boy? Hello. Okay. Hold on, my son's down here. All right. I'm doing a lot. Good night. Good night. Tell everybody on here good night. Good night. All right. Wait, they can hear me? Yeah, they can hear you. All right, good night, Lynn. All right. Now, what was I talking about? My kids coming down here interrupted me. Um... Talking about the Super Bowl. I was talking about the Super Bowl. Um, a lot of people are still talking about the Usher, Alicia Keys situation. Um, there's a lot of very interesting takes on it. There's a whole bunch of very interesting takes. It's very interesting. I'm, and and I, again, I think they did a phenomenal performance. Um, I'm, I'm trying to see how they're going to top this. Who should they get next year? Who should they get next year? Because, shit, you know, Usher should raise the bar on this thing. The only person that's really on Usher's level like that 
Y'all know who it is. We, we know Beyonce and all that, but, you know, Chris Breezy, Chris Brown. And, yeah, now, I don't know if they're going to put Breeze. They should put him up there. I don't know what his relationship is with Jay-Z. You know, I think I think there was something kind of funny style going on over there because Jay-Z is, you know, clicked in with Rihanna and Chris had that situation with Rihanna. So I, I don't know what their relationship is. And these shows are halftime shows are put together by Rock Nation. So I don't know. But I hope they would consider Chris Brown. Chris Brown would be great for it. And I know the, the dominant society will try to bring up and pull up old janky stuff against the brother. But again, I think it would be a phenomenal performance. So that's just me. Um, and speaking of that, there was a woman um, who was tweeting and people were getting on her bumper about Travis Kelsey, who was um, plays for Kansas City. And um, they won. And Travis Kelsey is dating um, Taylor Swift. And this woman got on Twitter talking about, uh, what did she say? She was like, yeah, Travis Kelsey dated all them black women. And now he's dating Taylor Swift. And now we looking at him funny style. We, we looking at him funny. You know, it seems strange he's dating a white woman now. Black women are looking at her, looking at him funny. Black women... Well, they, no, no, no. Black women are not looking at black women. Don't give a damn. And we're looking at this woman's background and we saw a, a gazillion foreign flags in this woman's thing. Th this is why I don't like people who are not FBA trying to represent or speak for black culture or the black collective consciousness because they bring some stuff that we ain't even on. Most foundational black Americans ain't given a damn about a white boy who's dating a white girl. That's them tether women have that zaddy worshiping thing. FBA women ain't tripping on no damn Travis Kelsey. They ain't tripping on them. That, that dude with all them other black NFL players. That's who the sisters over here looking at. They're looking at some of them other brothers who's playing. They ain't thinking about Travis Kelsey. Them tether women, you know, oh, zaddy. Why are you forsaking me? Why, why are you forsaking me for a white woman? It's ridiculous. Now, let me get some calls in here. Let me get some calls because we got a lot of folks in here. Y'all raise your hand if you want to get on because we do have a lot of folks. Let's get McKinley. Let's get McKinley in here. All right, McKinley, hop on. McKinley, hop on. All right, McKinley. Okay. Let's get um, Jay Stunner. Let's get Jay Stunner in here. Yes, McKinley. Okay, McKinley, what's going on, brother? Hey, how you doing? I'm good, sir. How are you? What's on your mind? Excellent. I, I want to speak on the, uh, the football game. Yes, sir. The songs and the reason that we should have the song. In 1919, during the Red Summer, victorious black soldiers returning to the United States from World War I were snatched off the bus, still in uniform, and hung. There's a book called A History of the American Negro, 1916 to 1966. And on page 28, it will give you verification of this. And that's why I feel that the song for black people, particularly black men, should be sung at every football game until they can explain to me, you and everybody else, how is it possible that these black men coming from World War I were hung while still in their uniform. Yes, indeed. And also, um, around the same time, uh, there were a lot of race riots going on in World War I because they stopped immigration. They stopped a lot of the Europeans from coming over here to get those jobs, those factory jobs that were very important. And a lot of Black people were getting those jobs. And anytime we start getting a financial 
um, foothold anywhere, even if it's minor, the dominant society, they go on alert. And there was a, a just a rash of lynchings going on around the country and also black people fighting the hell back. There were black people fighting back and all of that eventually led to the Tulsa situation where the same thing, you had black veterans defending the black community because the white supremacists wanted to um, target a black dude because they said he raped a white woman. And the story was he bumped into the white woman, but then there's another story that he was actually dating the white woman. So there's a million stories about what actually happened with that. But nevertheless, the white supremacists were going to try to lynch that brother and some of the former black soldiers in, in Oklahoma and Tulsa was like, no, we're not going to do that. And they started on the first day of that, that riot, the black people were beating the brakes off the white people in Oklahoma. I want y'all to understand that. I think we talked about that in um, Hidden Colors 5, one of my movies, we talked about it. But the first day, the brothers were giving them people the damn business. That's why they had to go run and hop in planes and drop um, nitroglycerin bombs on the damn community and, and blow it up from the air. The first time in American history, bombs were dropped on an American city. It was black people in Oklahoma. They had to get up there and get in planes and drop plane, drop bombs on them, dude. Because um, there was a lot of jealousy there because of the success of those black people. And they, it, they always got to put us in our place. These people would go to immense lengths to, to stop any kind of progress from us. But thank that brother for calling up. He just reminded me of that. Um, let's get Jay Stunner. Hey, what's up, Tariq? What's up, brother? I'm How doing are you? well. Man, last time I called and I talked to you, I had my gold grill in. And when I heard myself play back, <laughs> it sounded like I had like a little lisp. I didn't think nobody, I didn't want anybody to think I had a hankering for some bussy or something. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, no, no. No, that's everything is good, man. Everything, what's on your well, mind? <clears throat> Excuse me. Yeah, I'm from Richmond, California. I don't know uh, if you're familiar with it. It's like five, ten minutes above Oakland. Yeah. So oh, back yeah. in the uh, late 80s, early 90s, there was a train uh, filled with military weapons that they just they just oh, yeah. parked it outside on the train tracks. And everybody in the rich had uh, been able to go ahead and get those guns. So that's why a lot of those AKs and military assault white rifles and weapons, they were purposely put in our communities, you know, back in the, you know, 20, 30, 40 years ago. But they also did the oh, same yeah. thing in Chicago. And I know you from uh, the L, you've been in LA for a minute. Did you hear about the same oh, thing yeah. happening in, in South Central LA where they, they parked the uh, train with the guns? Oh yeah, oh, yeah. the train in Compton. Oh yeah, I heard about it. I know about that. So, yeah, they've been doing that tactic for years, man. Uh, a mysterious train pops up and there's guns in it. Um, you know, they they encourage that kind of stuff. And then they do the gun buyback so then they can dust the guns and, and wait a couple of months to start busting people who brought the guns in for the buybacks. So it's a whole con game that they got, man. It's a whole thing. And they, they put the guns in there at the same time. Watch it. When they put the guns in, New shipments of new drugs come in at the same exact time because they know what's going to happen. These folks kind of sit up and, and go through like a computer and just kind of plan all this stuff out. They know what's going to happen. They know if they go to an economically depressed area, and they flood that area with any kind of drugs or new designer drugs and then make sure that some guns mysteriously pop up. They understand that an underworld economy is going to go down. And when there's conflicts within that underworld economy, nobody's going to be able to go to the police to iron out their conflicts and their differences. So they're going to have to get them guns to iron it out themselves. So they are they know that there's going to be gunplay because people are not going to be able to go to law enforcement. So people are going to have to protect themselves. They're going to have to try to get at other um, dealers, they're going to have to get out of the dope fiends. It's going to be a whole um, cluster flop of nonsense going on on the streets. So they know what they're doing when they do stuff like that. That's why I put the blame on them. 
I put always put the blame on the white supremacists. They are the blame for it. Um, tribe, hop on. Um, hi, Tariq. How are you, sir? What's going on, brother? Um, good. Um, we just wanted to ask a few questions. Um, you know, uh, with the rhetoric that's going on right now on on Twitter and other social medias, we see a lot of um, hate towards um, towards you, foundational Black Americans. Um, it's not just coming out from the white white um, supremacists, but also from us Africans and um, you know the Latin community and all that. Yeah. Um, do you do you see um, all this rhetoric as somewhat genocidal? Because I feel like you guys are. Um, looking at it in a um, political way, as in like, in terms of voting, and that's how you guys want to tackle it. But it's actually getting more genocidal. And these white supremacists are trying to recruit everybody to, um, to go against you guys. So do you guys have like militias or, or like armed groups that, you know, um, are ready to, to um, go and start some something in case something um, goes down? Well, the thing is, if we had some, I wouldn't talk about it on the phone. Um, secondly, um, the white supremacists, they've always been against us. That's nothing new. They've always been genocidal against us. That's nothing new. Um, the tethers and the, the non-whites that they try to recruit, we ain't tripping on them. If we can handle, look, we're foundational black Americans, dude. We have a spiritual strength and a spiritual essence that makes us stand up against billions of dollars worth of militarized tanks and, and weaponry out here in these streets. If we can stand up to a bunch of militarized white supremacists with trillion dollar tanks rolling up and down Baltimore, South Central L.A., Ferguson, we could stand up to that. We can stand up to some um, injera eating tether wearing some flip-flops and a big forehead, talking about what he going to do. That's that's really not a problem for us. That's some goddamn light work, dude. We wish one of them motherfuckers would roll up on us with some bullshit. You understand what I'm saying? Nah. Yeah, I have no doubt. I have no doubt that you guys um will be victorious in all of this because yeah. you guys have a it, history and a record. Of. We don't need no militia. I don't need no militia for uh, Dinesh D'Souza, all right? <laughs> We 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 can give him them hands if we need to, yeah. So, so that that's he'll be back. One sec. Um, can I just say something? Yeah. Go ahead. Um, you, it's not just um, it's not about you guys winning or or losing. It's just that it might come as a surprise because you don't know when this because all this rhetoric that's going on right now everywhere in social media is is against um foundational Black Americans what and else? everybody can see it. That's not new. It's always been against us. These people have always been targeting us, having vitriol towards us, hating us no matter what we do. We're used to it. The thing is, we're so used to it, we're not scared of them. That's why when something goes down, y'all see, we fight them back. We get out here in these streets and turn the hell up if need be. We don't have to form militia groups because the militia is in you. The militia is a mindset. And that's the thing that, that a lot of people have a problem with as far as foundational black Americans. They see when things go down, we can put them differences aside real fast and get things popping. They know we can get shit popping real quick and we can start organizing real fast. You understand? So it's not a problem. So we're going to be fine. But and when we talk about delineating and all of that, it's not just politically. You know, right now it's a political season, but we're talking about this is the new cultural norm of us acknowledging and celebrating our unique culture and our unique lineage and our unique spirituality as foundational Black Americans. That makes sense? Yeah, it makes sense. But I just thought like... Um... Being ready is better than just um, going with with the flow, you know. Whenever whatever whenever happens, and then just you, you go think with it. Um, ready? No, I, I believe preparation, like military um, type preparation, is necessary. Um, that's what I. Just my opinion. Well, the thing is, man, when you stay ready, you ain't got to get ready. We already know some shit can go down. We've already been through the hardships. We know how to survive. We 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 stay ready. We're already ready. We wake up ready for some bullshit. Dude, when we get up and leave the house each day, we don't know if we're going to run into a genocidal race soldier 
a cop working for law enforcement who's part of some white supremacist group. We understand that threat that's always there. We, we, we deal with it every day, so we stay ready for it. That's why when some shit goes down and the community, the community gets fed up with it, the streets turn up. So we already know what the deal is, so we already stay ready. All right? All right, fair enough. Thanks, Dorit. Thank you so much. All right? So, yeah, what he's talking about is kind of having a formal military. No, 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 no. That won't work because we are the, you know, no, no, no. You're not going to have a formal military. No, no, no. That's not going to work. See, the, that's why the Seminoles were successful. Let me give you all a real quick game and I'm going to get you, um, I don't know, 45 something. I don't know what your name is. I get you in a second. But at this point, hold on. Let me make a point. I got to make a point real quick. Um, the, the Seminoles, when... The Seminole Wars happened. They tried to go toe to toe with the U.S. Army in Florida. And you watch my movie American Maroon. We talk about this. They had something called um, Fort Negro, Fort Fort Mose, down in Florida. They had a military fort and the whole shebang. So they tried to go um, empire to empire. You know, head up with the the U.S. Army, and all the U.S. Army did, they out-militarized them. They blew the place up. Then they said, okay, this is a learning experience. They are more militarily thorough than us. So we're going to have to do something and create something called guerrilla warfare. That was created by us. This whole hit and then blend in with nature, this strike and this asymmetrical warfare. We had to um, do warfare in a different way. It, it had to be indirect. We had to strike silently. It had to be covert. And they were very successful at it. In the military, they study what the Black Seminoles did right now. And they they look at that as a major L. They don't even call it um, what it really was called back then. When the Seminole War was going on, the, the army generals, they got real with each other. They said, hey, this isn't an Indian war. These are not Indians. These are niggas. We're fighting niggas down here. And these niggas are beating the brakes off of us. And eventually they had to sign a proclamation to say, hey, okay, y'all niggas get your freedom. Just get out of Florida. That's why they, they sent them on the Trail of Tears and they ended up out there in Oklahoma. All right. You had to throw that history out there. Now, um, 45 Perk. Hello, bro. I uh, call from Scotland and the UK. Uh, All right, what's going on out there in Scotland? It's very, very wet and cold, it's, it's, uh, as per usual. But yes, I just want to, I just want to say, like, like it's all a load of bullshit because we all, we all should just stick together because these people that are at the top level will never allow us to become one. Never allow us to of the cog- cog- cognitive mind and it's do you know what I mean like they want us divided so we, we got to stick together white black well, here's, the, here's, the thing. here's the thing my, my Scottish brother here's the thing we wanted to stick together for a long time and when you Scots and when you Scots and no, hold on listen listen <clears throat> when you Scots and you Irish cats immigrated over here we wanted to stick together because y'all were, you know, smacked around in Europe by some of the the wealthy class. They were smacking you around up there and y'all were poor and many of you were landless when you came over here. And we thought we had a camaraderie with you. But then the the people on top said, hey, you and I got something called whiteness that they don't have. Yeah, I know you're poor, you're landless, you stank, and you're eating potatoes, but at least you're white and you're not one of them. So how about I make you guys police officers? And you guys said, bet, and start doing the foot soldiering and dirty work for the white supremacists, and then you became de facto white supremacists yourself. So with that stick together thing, eh, yeah, you know, brother, we tried that. that. That's that's some history that I didn't know. So thank you very much, and uh, I apologise for those assholes. Uh, because that's not the feeling right now. That's that's not the exact same feeling. Uh, mm-hmm. Every the feeling now is this is we're all one. We're all one. That doesn't matter. We, we have people to talk with so much money that's just influencing us all. <sighs> 
just stick together, guys. Come on. There you go. When y'all get it, when y'all give us our money, then let's let's have the stick together talk. When we get them reparations checks, then circle back to me and let's talk about that stick together thing. But I want to stick together after I get my check. When I get my compensation for all the devious stuff that y'all were doing, yeah, I'll say it's in the past, but that money ain't in the past. All of that wealth that y'all got from my family, all of that labor, that wealth is still here. Y'all still eating good off that. So let me get that paper and I'll sit down with you and we'll hold hands and I'll eat some of them Irish potatoes. And what's some of the Scottish dishes? What do y'all eat? I should have asked them what they eat up there in Scotland. Um, corn, beef. What, what, what do they eat up there? What do they eat in Scotland there? Corn, beef. Well, that's Irish. Okay. What, what's the Scottish dish? Lamb chops? I don't know. I don't know. Sure. Let's get um, Trenice Evans. Trenice Evans. All right. Am I pronouncing your name, sir? All right. Trenice Evans, you want to hop on? Yeah. Hey, how are you? I'm good, Trenice. Am I pronouncing your name right? No, it's it's that's not correct. It's actually Trennis, but that's okay. Trennis, I've, okay. I've been okay. called worse. <laughs> okay, Trennis. Now, Trennis, are you on? Um, you got some headphones on or something? You're a little muffled. No, I, I don't have headphones on. There Is that go. better? You're much better. Much. Yeah, yeah. I apologize. Not a problem. So, what is on your mind, Mister T? Well, you know, I saw the space. It's about the Black National Anthem. Yes. Listen, may I share my thoughts? Go ahead. I respect everybody's position. I respect your right to your free speech. I respect your right to your position. And I honor that position because that's what America is supposed to be built on. I think we could at least agree so far. Absolutely. I would disagree on the idea that there is a one or two or three or four or however many national anthems because the entire idea is based on that it's a we the people situation and it always reminds me of this old Hagor the horrible i don't know how old you are but you know at 50 i remember this old Hagor the horrible comic and it, it's got a old Hagor sitting up there on the ledge and he's looking down from the castle and there's all these people out there with torches and pitchforks. And there's this advisor to the king, if you will, Hagar the Horrible. And he's looking up at him and he says, well, Hagar looks over and he says, well, uh, you know, well, they've got us. It's, it's all over. It's the end. And he says, oh, don't worry, sir. All we have to do is convince the torch people that the pitchfork people want to take their torches. And I just don't subscribe to the idea that we come from an America where we're all going to fall for that bait and we're going to fall victim to the idea that they want to divide us. I want to be a unified America. And I will tell you that I've recognized some things in this land in some 50 years and what I've done. And I won't get into that. One of the things that I'm certain of is that anytime that the government who serves neither side, neither religion, or neither race. And when you say neither, I will say we can expand that to either or, or what have you. At any time, those individuals are able to force division into our brains and create this ideology where we are not one people, we are not in a common goal, we're losing. Because I don't think there's an enemy other than the fact that there's people that mean to control us. I believe that we have a great opportunity in this country to continue the ideology of success for all people and freedom. And if we can't get together on the freedom aspect before the people that mean to control us through those levers of control, if we don't strip those gears, we're all in a hell of a lot of trouble. I think what we're all seeing now and this time, nobody seems to be happy with 
with the government. If I ask a group full of Democrats or a room full of libertarians or Republicans, and they can be as staunch as one side or the other of the aisle or not. If I ask them if their legislatures represent them, they say no. And if I were to ask them if those are the kind of people they want running the country, the answer is no. And it doesn't matter who's in the White House. They would suggest that it's been stolen or it's not the right person or it's not consistent with our views. And if you ask if the judiciary or our third branch of government is representative of the thoughts of the people and it's supporting them, the answer is no. All right. Yet here we are divided. All right. Now, here's the thing about the divisiveness. Yes, sir. About that, because now we're going back to the, the, the national anthem thing. Now, if we look at the national anthem, which is the Star Spangled Banner, that song, the complete song, has references to slavery in it, which is pretty divisive. We have another national anthem. They lift every voice and sing. That's not a violent song. It has nothing to do with slavery. That song is for real about equality. And it's the Black National Anthem because we as foundational Black Americans, we have a very unique history in the United States that other people don't have. We are very exceptional people. So there absolutely should be uh, an exceptional ceremonial song for us that doesn't have something as divisive as slavery in it that we're supposed to be forced to just kind of overlook. Because if there's anything derogatory towards another group, they're not going to sit there and sing it and, and grin and smile about it. They're going to oppose it. They're going to be against that, as they should. And we're not saying that we're against the entire Star Spangled Banner. We're not against um, national unity. But the thing is, we are in a global system of white supremacy, which is a real factor. And we see that in sports itself, because people talk about unity. But we have a, a sports genre that's predominated by black males. When those black males do something that people in the audience don't like, many of those audience members get to yelling out nigga and all types of racial epithets on a regular basis. This is very common. So we can't ignore the systematic racism and white supremacy and anti-black racism that is commonly levied at us. And we should have that special acknowledgement because nothing is done to rectify it. So us just having a little song that shows dignity and pride and blackness, if that ruffles people's feathers, there's something going on there that's really not about us. It's about the thought of us carrying ourselves with dignity that's what's kind of bothering people, right? What's your thoughts on that? Um, I don't disagree with you about carrying a race or an individuality or a movement or a people with dignity. I think you have a great point there. Right. Well, I'm not here to disagree with you. I'm suggesting that the foremost, and I think this really goes deeper than a song. I think the idea that the national anthem um, the, is held in some sort of semblance of slavery. I think the only slavery that they were trying to undo at that time was the slavery held by the king across the pond. Now, other issues exist. I don't deny that. And I don't suggest that you're incorrect in your uh, recognition of certain aspects of what you're suggesting. Right. All I'm suggesting is that is the last time I checked, whether an individual, the color of their skin, rather whatever it may be, it wasn't the defining characteristic. And a dear friend of mine who's deceased now and uh, happens to be a black man, he said, the most uninteresting thing about me is the color of my skin. And always uh, meant something to me the what he said the way he said that it wasn't just what he said it was the way he said it it was so important and because there was so much more to the individual and I think there's so much more to a race but at one point in time somewhere along the line regardless of we can squabble 
about issues. And I'm not suggesting that this be rela- what you're talking about is related only to a squabble. Right, right, right. But I mean, Democrats, Republicans, conservatives, libertarians, uh, you know, leftists, uh, Marxists, and what have you. We could, we could get down in that. But before we can address anything, before we can have a country, before we can have a foundation, before we can have what was intended, we're going to have to come together and root out the evil that exists that means to control us. That's just where I am. There you go. And I believe this. And if I may, one more. Give me just one more minute of leeway. I really appreciate it. Yeah. I'm not saying that you don't have a right to your dignity, to your song, to your beliefs, to supporting your race and your culture. I support all of that. What I'm suggesting is the unity that needs to exist now, foremost, before we address anything else, is the one that stops and strips the levers of control from the people that mean to undermine our ability to move forward as a people. Then we can work out the rest of this. I mean, if we try and work that out first, the great powers that be, as we witness now, they're going to squash us off, and yeah, we're not going to have anything. All right. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate you. Trenice, I think that's your name. Okay. Let's do Abdul Diop. Yeah, what's up? Hello. What's going on, Abdul Diop? I'm good. I'm good. How are you? I'm good. What, what's going on with your phone, brother? Oh, there's nothing wrong with my phone now. I mean, I'm... Okay. Oh, can you hear me? Uh, okay, take your earphones out, brother. Oh, oh my mic is I don't have any earphones. Oh, are you on a car? No. No, I'm okay, at this, Okay, you see something, something. You got something plugged in that's janky. Oh, really? Oh, oh that's strange because I'm just on, like, my mic is just on. I'm just at home. Okay. All right. I can hear you a little bit better now. Okay, you can hear me better now? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. you're still kind of muffled. Are you wearing a, a, a turban or some shit? No. Uh, Okay. All right. So what's on your mind, man? Uh, well, I mean, what's on my, I mean, what I'd like to just talk about, just, uh, just talk about, uh, you know, some of the social issues that, you know, that, that we're hearing about in the USA and, and things like that. Like, um, hearing that there's, uh, a, a black, a black national anthem now, like, and people have a problem with that. Like, yeah. There are some people who have a problem with that. I mean, I personally don't see no issue with it. I mean, because black people, I mean, they have, I mean, they have built it. I mean, they did play a huge role in building the country. I, I, your, your phone, brother, I, I got to get them off. Oh, well, that, that, I, the phone, man, it's so annoying. Whatever, something is going on with your phone, brother. I don't know what it is. I don't know what was going on with that phone. It was extremely annoying. Cameron, let me get you. You're saying that in a wheelchair. You don't have your legs don't work, and you're talking all that shit. We're not gonna die from you. You, you gonna roll us over with your chair? He he got out of here. What you gonna do? He's gonna use his wheelchair to roll over our Jordans. All right. Oh, that's one of these incels. He's. Let me translate that. A girl he likes. He looked at her Instagram, and some brother is banging on her. She's she's laying up with a brother, so he's mad. That was very personal. It sounded like a girl was involved. There's a Karen that he wanted, and he he found out she likes Soul Pole, and now he's having a an alt right moment. Lord, and, and and to the African guy who called earlier. See, we're not listen that we're used to that. Do you think we're afraid of that guy? <laughs> No, we're not. Cameron, hop on, sir. Hey, what's up, Mr. How you doing, Cameron? What's on your mind, brother? I can't complain. Two things. One, next time you come to Harlem, man, make sure you get some real soul food. Don't go to no other borough, but come to our neighborhood. Which man. which store? Which, which place? Because I done been all over Harlem, and I like it. Go, you got... 
you, you got to go to Melbourne's. Oh. That's that that's Sylvia's that that's Sylvia's um niece Man, right there. I, I went there multiple times. Love Melbourne's. I'm already. Yeah, that. I oh, I didn't know you oh, was yeah. over there, but yeah. And oh, second, yeah. I, and on a serious note, I, I I really have to um, cause you know being from New York City, I. Uh, I gotta give I gotta give my thoughts and prayers to our FBA family down there in New York, cause I tagged you on that um on the Twitter about how those migrants they literally got caught on camera attacking these police officers, and they got out without no yeah. bail. Now, also, now it's gotten so bad that you know the mayor, you know he you know he imposed a um a curfew on on, on these show, on these uh on these spots, right? Yeah. Because these these people is literally stealing. They just stealing from random people and stuff like that, and they doing it, you know, in in a lot of these neighborhoods. So all my black Americans over there, be careful, man. Because like because like you said, in you you know, in your other show, we don't know who these people are. Yeah. And now these migrant these immigrants is really, is getting irritated because they can't find a place to stay. Now they turn into crime. Oh yeah. And now they imposing these curfews. But the fact of the matter is, these people are not getting charged with no crime. Yeah. So I'm sitting there like, what is going to happen? Because next thing you know, somebody's going to end up getting hurt. Because I mean, they literally attacked the police. Five, yo, five immigrants literally attacked the police officer, yo, in broad daylight on camera, and they didn't get charged for nothing. Wait. They let him out on bail, and it was reported that these cats, one of these cats, fled to California. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, a lot what? of them ended up bouncing. They left the state immediately. I'm like, man, they giving these people not just slaps on the wrist they're giving them get out of jail free cards and passes so it's an interesting dynamic man that's why man i'm so cool on the democrats right now oh carl hop on man hey hey can you hear me yes mr oh carl how are you doing well thank you um yeah i don't know uh that somebody that would come on and say uh some stupid shit like that person that came on and said that would oh yeah pretty uh yeah that is oh, yeah. uh that is just uh rough to think and, that and, people and that's why in that we, mindset you know and that's why we have the black national anthem you know we we have to have stuff like that because of you know we we have to deal with that type of stuff but what's on your mind brother what's on your mind well, you know, I was still kind of filling out the conversation, but on my mind really is that, um, I don't know, I just think a lot of people are really uh, digging at the divide in so many different ways, you know? It's like so many people are digging at it, you know? Yeah. Picking at it. And um, it seems to be like, even like this, this, like this app, this X algorithm, like, there's a lot of people that come up on my timeline where it's like, I don't, I have to check. Am I, am I even following this person? No, I'm not. Mm. But, um, but they're just they, like, they, they somehow show up and I get to see their voice every single time. And it's like, and it's like, uh, something I definitely don't, don't agree with, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And just because I'm, I'm looking at things I don't agree with. I'm kind of reading the other side. I'm reading things that I don't like because I know what I like. I can read about what I like all day, but you know, that's, that's, that's just, that's not going to get me anywhere any further. I'd like to try and at least understand some people that I might come in contact with who think differently than me. Yes. And so, indeed. All right, thank you so much. I did. I was just kind of rambling on and on. Carrie, let's get Carrie in here. What's up, Carrie? <clears throat> Miss Carrie, hop on, <clears throat> hop on, dear. Excuse me. All right, then we'll get um. All right, Carrie ain't said nothing. Well, Carrie, you here? Then we're gonna get Lester. Carrie, you here? Yeah, I'm here. Can you hear me? Hey, I can hear you now. What's up, dear? Okay, that. Thank you. Thank you for bringing me up. I was just thinking, Tariq, if 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 these white supremacists, if these people want unity, they can they can show us in some way that they're hearing what what they're saying. You know, they can in good faith get these Asians off our back, stop them from constantly, constantly fucking with us. I just think that we noticed that. You know, 
carry the, the the sound. I could barely hear you, beloved. Everybody, some of y'all wearing these earphones, earpieces, and it's really janking up the sound where I can barely hear you, family. So let's get the audio good. Lester, hop on, man. Lester, hop on. All right. Okay, Lester. You want to hop on, Mr. Lester? Tariq? There you go. What's up, Lester? Tariq, huge fan, man. Going back to when you did that interview with Jared Taylor. Uh, oh, yeah. Per- yeah, personally, I um, I found you really endearing in it, man. I was impressed. Yes, indeed. Um, we're talking about the Black National Anthem. Now, uh, can can you uh, elaborate on that for me? Like, what is the purpose of the Black National Anthem? It's really just it's been a, it's been something that's when that's been sung in black households and black institutions um, since the early 1900s before the United States adopted the Star Spangled Banner as the national anthem. So it's been um, somewhat of a de facto national anthem among black people. Um, before the current national anthem. So it's been a cultural thing. So it's just been, it's basically just paying homage to um, foundational black Americans and our culture. As the foundational black American, you don't think there's anything, I mean, I know that, you know, if it goes back to the 19th century or, you know, what have you, you don't, you don't think there's anything divisive about it or, or can you see how white Americans might have a problem with that? Well, do white Americans have a problem with the Star Spangled Banner referencing slavery? Yeah, yeah, I think there are a lot that do. They don't because they don't have a problem singing that song. Wow, right? It has a slave reference in it. Slavery sure, wasn't sure it, does. sure it doesn't one stanza, but that stanza is not sung anymore. Uh, but still, but shit, um, you know that's part of the song, and that when you look at the whole song, you know that song is. It has a slave reference, even though they are being politically cor- correct to not sing that part. That's just like a white person singing a song with the word nigga in it, and you, you're silent when the word nigga comes up. You're still singing the song, you know? Yeah, I guess so. I think it's, I think it's a little different, maybe, but uh, I don't know. It, it's think... not divisive. It's just you're giving recognition um, to foundational Black American culture in a sporting event that's predominated by foundational black American athletes. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, There are a lot of foundational black Americans in the NFL for sure. Um, But I mean, you can see the, like the problems with this, right? Like how people can see two. The only problem is um, when we show the dignity of foundation of black American culture, that's when it's a problem. Now, when they do shit like have Lizzo running around sporting events with her ass out, they don't really have a problem with that. Yeah, but Tariq, what's the problem with foundational black Americans singing the Star Spangled Banner? If we've eliminated the stanza that that references slavery, and right, and we and we sing that song too. We, we so one of the best renditions of the Star Spangled Banner is Whitney Houston, so we do that sure. too. But we're also saying, okay, let us do this. So if we're going to do that, let us do this as well. And some of the games, it's not even a mandatory thing. It is just some games they do it, and this was the biggest stage on the world, and we got out there and we sung a song that was culturally relevant to foundational black American culture, because we are a very unique group and we're getting the recognition that we're supposed to get. And that's not divisive. The song ain't like F whitey, F whitey. It's like, it's a song about lift every voice. It's a spiritual song. So we're, we're, we're blessing the place with that spiritual foundational black American eloquence. That's all it is. I suppose. Right? I suppose. Hey, Tariq, I appreciate your time, man. Yeah, thank you so much. Of course, man. You take care. Mm-hmm. My goodness, man. It's damn. It's not divisive. It's a gospel song. Good Lord. It's a gospel song, ladies and gentlemen. It's like, hey, black folks, let, let, let us bless this place. Let us give y'all some of our spiritual essence here. 
before we we engage in a game that's full of violence, you know, let's let's lift every voice and say, let's show some dignity here. Let's give it up for the Most High. It's a very very dignified song. You understand? Yeah, they they're making it seem like the Black Panthers came out there and start singing "Fight the Power." Oh, that's so divisive. A gospel song is divisive. Think about what you're saying. Lift every voice and sing to earth and heaven rings. Ring with the harmonies of liberty. Let us rejoice. Rise high as the listening skies. That's a very honorable song. Yeah? God of our weary. years, God of our silent tears, those that have brought us thus far on the way. Oh my God, it's a, it's a song, it's a gospel song. It is a gospel song. It's, it's not nothing for people to get bent out of shape over. All right, let me get some other people in here. <clears throat> um, Huckleberry, I think that's your name. Let me get Grinds in here. Let me get Grinds in here first. Let me get Grinds TV in here first. And there's a white supremacist in here showing white man. He's showing a bunch of pictures of a white man buck breaking a black man. And I'm definitely not letting you on. Oh, we got the breast model in here. I see you, Harley. I see you down there. We got the OnlyFans breast model. <laughs> yeah, they, they in here heavy. All right. All right, um, Grinds. What's up, Brother Tariq? How you doing? My brother, I'm good. How are you, sir? All right. Sorry about last week. Uh, I had some type of delay with the connection. By the time I finally got on, I got dropped. <laughs> oh, wow, 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 wow. But we're here. We're here. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Um, so, yeah, so I'm from Chicago. I know you were requesting for Chicago to uh, come and chop it up with you. Yeah, so I saw that video. Uh, and it looked like the southeast side now the thing is uh there I, I posted that clip that you were referencing in the purple pill the chat um yeah. i also posted something else um something that i had posted probably like two weeks ago from uh that's not too far from that same area the southeast side where these illegals were allowed to go into that old abandoned building and it looks like they had tried to uh spin the narrative you know, uh, what it looked like and what was being reported by uh, some of the um, uh, black American citizens across the street. It appeared that they were breaking in. And then you had this white guy come in and uh, do a news uh, thing talking about, oh, no, we let them in. You know, uh, they didn't break in. And these people that are, you know, let's let's show all of these people on camera. You know, these people that's already on the block that's calling the police. Uh, they're hating these, you know, they have to spend a narrative that we're hateful now all of a sudden uh, right. on these illegals. No, we're not hating on a doggone thing. You are literally rejecting the people that deserve these tangibles and reparations, by the way. Uh, but you're giving it to the people that just got here. Um, that's the that's the effect of that office of new Americans. But what about the Americans that were already here? Um, right. Also, uh, shout out to uh, Sir Major and Reups. Uh, because the uh, space that you had a couple of days ago when you all were discussing that um, coon comedian, uh, later on that day, we had a space where he came in and we had a conversation with him. And we were, um, were I'll say, I say we because it's our space, but Reups and Sir Major actually addressed him and, and, and dealt with him about the repercussions of what he was doing. And of course, he continued to coon, coon it up and uh, make all kinds of excuses. Wow. Wow. I mean, Y'all stay on that cat's bumper, man. But thank you so much, Grind. I appreciate you, brother. Um, Huckleberry. Hey, Tariq. Can you hear me okay? Yes, ma'am. How are you? Here? I'm doing good. First time calling in, long time listener. How's everybody? How's the fam? Peace, love, blessings, all that good stuff. Yes, indeed. Now, what city are you in, dear? I'm in Dallas. Okay. Shout out to Dallas. What's yeah, be so. So first, I want to just say this whole Star Spangled Banner crazy stuff, it's it's kind of hilarious. I watched the um, beginning of the game and I knew as soon as they sang that song, I'm like, oh God, these people going to lose their mind tomorrow. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So I, I knew that was coming, but 
I want our family to understand that we are in the best time of our lives. We are demonstrating not a reactive um, behavior, but more of a proactive behavior for the first time in a very long time. We have like a psycho spiritual essence about us that reverberates throughout the globe. Whenever we get on code, as you say, and we focus on something, it shifts. And these people can feel it and they are very, very angry because of reparations. Mm -hmm. That is what all it is about. That's what this immigration, the whole bit, everything is about this. And I just wanted to point out two things because Tariq, you're a very smart man. I respect you so much. Mm -hmm. And I think that you and a lot of the black media, if we begin to like refocus some of our efforts on these two things that I think are a priority that we maybe should think about. So like one, the first thing is we really do need to push for some sort of federal recognition of FBA or Freedmen, yeah. because as much as we want to delineate when the resources begin to come, even at the local level today, we need to start delineating because these people are working collectively to push us out of all um, resources. OK, so it's yeah. time for us to begin to do that. And then the second thing that I wanted to mention is that we have to start figuring out a way that we can punish the political establishment. I mean, um, distracting from their voting system is very important. And I think we're doing a really good job. I think that message is getting out because politics is really just a global mechanism. I always say that to hoard resources away from us. It's the way they've done it globally. And they all get on code to do that. So we have to figure out a way to strategically punish them. And one of the things that I thought of is let's only spend our dollars on on holidays that we want to rec recognize, like a Red to Sussy, uh, you know, Juneteenth, things that we want to recognize. And let's hold our black dollars on their holidays. I know it's difficult for us to really boycott any one thing because we purchase everything from them. We don't really own anything. But I, I just thought it was worth mentioning. Maybe it's something we should give some thought to. On, on ways we can punish them. Great talking points, beloved. Thank you so much. Yeah, the sister raised some some very good points. Um, what we should be doing to build on what the sister said, we need to have our own grassroots Freedmen's Bureau, where we're already on our own, going into the lineages, checking people in seeing who's who just are we we're, we're getting the ball started already we kind of need to just get like a foundation going where we are setting up a mechanism where lineages can be checked out so when we do start getting resources that's lineage based we can already have the infrastructure or the template there to say okay this is how we're going to check people's backgrounds because let me tell y'all something these people are plotting on how to weasel their way into our damn lineage. They're trying. They're trying to play dough their way in. They're trying to figure out, because we've delineated, how can we, Tethers, latch on to that damn lineage somehow? So I want y'all to feel some of the conversations that's being said, because I hear when people come around, well, my cousin is Liberian, and Liberia was founded by FBA. So does that make me part FBA too, nigga? It's that type of shit. You dig? So they're trying. They, it, it's hard for them to make the reach. See, that's why, because we kind of set the parameters. We've already said what defines a foundation of Black American, and we did it on our own terms. That's the thing that messes everybody up, and they can't remix it. We've already established what makes you a foundational Black American. If your lineage can go back to the 1870 census form, that makes you a foundational Black American. Your lineage has to go back to these 1800 census forms. You understand? You have to come from the lineage of the people who built this country. You have to have a non-immigrant lineage in order to be considered foundational Black American. So we set those parameters, and people hate that because, you know, that's a power move. When you start naming yourself and then you define the parameters of what the name is, 
That's a power move. And when we start making power moves, look at how these people act. Look at how they're acting. That's why that's why they're always in our spaces. They're always in our mix. They're always looking at what we're doing because they see how power works and they understand how power works. And when we start exerting certain levels of power, you know, that raises their antenna. Uh, let's get some other people in here. Let's get, um, um, let me see. Um, double use. Mr. Double use. Double use. All right. Double use. You want to hop on, brother? Uh, while we're waiting on double U's. From the culture of the American South, where roots hold stories, comes a natural deodorant inspired by generations of wisdom. Introducing Root Work, the all-natural foundational Black American-based deodorant infused with the magic of High John the Conqueror Root. Our unique blend enriched with this legendary root offers 24-hour protection rooted in the power of nature. Embrace this deodorant that celebrates culture, history, and your well-being. Unlock the magic of root work today. Experience the pure essence of nature. Visit rootworkstyle.com and make the switch to a healthier cultural choice. 